right, it's wonderful to uh, see you all this morning. And um, it's great to pray for mothers this morning, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, my mum is not a Christian, so she needs your prayers. My kids call her silly grandma. So uh, that says a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> so if you remember in your prayers, please pray for Dean's mum, silly grandma. <laughs> As I get older, um, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, um, there's always a tendency to become more and more cynical. Do you find that? Yeah. No, it's just me, is it? <laughs> and I always try to push against that, and, and the Word of God helps me too. But do you know what? Peter goes on and on and on about how he was in the police force, and I just think, was he? Was he really? Was he? <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I'm a researcher, so I went on a bit of a hunt and I found yeah. photographic evidence of Peter in the police. <laughs> Trust me, it's real. I got that from trustmeomadoctor.com. <laughs> Oh uh, dear, sorry Peter. <laughs> Seriously, we are new creations in Christ, aren't we? What a fabulous series to look at. And we've already looked at our new identity in Christ, how we're accepted, we're secure, we are significant. Peter talked a couple of weeks ago about the new authority that we're under. So this morning, I'm going to try and talk about how we go about exercising the authority that Christ has given to us. And then next week... Finn will be talking about how we grow as we exercise that authority. And um, really, to me, this is a big topic. So um, I'm just going to scratch the surface this morning. I'll just bring a few thoughts that I hope will help you. And hopefully the Holy Spirit's directed me. And I want you to know, before I um, bring this message to you, the message that I'm bringing to you, honestly, I'm preaching to myself first. Yeah. All right? So as I look at this message, um, I'm just looking to see what God is saying to me first, and then I'll share some of those thoughts with you. If they help you, that's fantastic. If they challenge you, that's even better. If they provoke you, just leave it to one side, all right? You're at liberty to do that. So let's make a start, shall we? And really, in order to be able to exercise the authority that God has given to us, there are some conditions that need to be met and one of the key things that we need to understand and in fact Peter's already said this a couple of weeks ago um, you cannot exercise authority unless you are first under yeah. authority you will never be able to exercise the authority that Christ gives to us unless you are truly under his authority so um, let me just start by saying there are essentially three phases that we go through as Christians or we should do um, and I love the way that Ralph Neighbour describes them. He, he puts them in simple terms, I hope. So the first phase that we go through as Christians is, is called justification. That's the technical term. And Ralph Neighbour puts that like this. He says, we are set free from the penalty of sin. Got that? Justification. We're set free from the penalty of sin. The second phase, sanctification. This is a process. This is where we are being set free from the power of sin. And then last one is glorification. We will be set free forever from the yeah. very presence of sin. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, justification is so wonderful. This is about accepting Jesus as saviour. It requires faith. We need to believe. That's where we receive all of the benefits straight away and it costs us absolutely nothing. We accept Jesus as Saviour, yeah. our sins are forgiven, yeah. we are born again, yeah. we receive eternal life, and yeah. we are saved. Hallelujah. That's wonderful. Yes. Justification cements our new identity, yeah. and because of it, we are indeed accepted, secure, and we are significant. That's good. Yeah. Now, the temptation is we stop there. We've received all of the benefits, but we are supposed to move into sanctification. Yeah. And the trouble is, it's a trap if we settle just for sanctification, just for justification, if we settle just for Jesus as Saviour. The next phase, sanctification, is all about making Jesus Lord. And it requires submission. We need to obey. It's a process where we are being transformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, I've been a Christian, I will this year, I'll have been a Christian for 37 
years. And I can tell you, and I'm sure you understand, that process can be extremely costly because it means we have to put to death the old self. You understand that? Yeah. Somebody yeah. not. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it's costly. It's because it's where we recognize sinful habits in our lives and we resolve to work with the Holy Spirit to be free from them. Now, when we choose to fight against the Holy Spirit, we resist that. I really don't want to change this area of my life. That's when it gets painful. Yeah. Yeah. That's when it gets painful because we're fighting against God. And so we really do need to remember that no matter how much pleasure some of these sinful habits bring, it's short-term pleasure. In the end, in the long term, they are all destructive, and that's what God wants to spare us from. So we need to learn to submit to God. We need to learn to make Jesus Lord as well as Saviour and find our pleasure in him as we learn to live in obedience to his word. So this is the key point I want to make first. Unless we are in submission to God, we will never be able to exercise the authority that every believer has been given. God is the one who delegates authority, and if we're not in submission to him, he will not allow us to exercise authority. Does that make sense? Yes. <clears throat> so it's an important question that we can ask ourselves. Ask yourself this, how do I know if I'm in submission to God? It's a simple thing to say, I'm in submission to God, but how do I know that I'm truly in submission to to God and a very simple measure is to ask yourself how much you are serving him service and submission are inextricably linked if you're in submission to God then you are ready willing and available to serve him in whatever capacity he asks and this morning I wonder if that describes me I wonder if that describes you am I servant listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 and verses 24 to 28 about the difference between authority in the world and authority in the church. They are very, very different. So this is from the Amplified Bible. It says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles have absolute power and lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them, tyrannizing them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your willing and humble slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, paying the price to set them free from the penalty of sin. <clears throat> you know, it's really, really important to see this. Jesus measures our spiritual maturity by our level of service, not by the number of years that we've been a Christian. And I want you to notice also that those with the greatest responsibility in the kingdom should be those who are giving the greatest level of service. The first among you is not just described as a servant, but as a slave. It's lovely to talk about ourselves as sons of God, but we don't often like to think of ourselves as slaves, do we? But this is the measure of maturity that Jesus himself uses. And he is our example. He came to serve, not to be served. Now, I'm going to say some things. Remember, I'm speaking to myself. If this provokes, please just lay it to one side. But there is a trap that we can fall into. And if we fall into this trap, we will find that it will strip us of all ability to exercise Christ's authority. And worse than that, we can find ourselves working against God rather than for him. So what is the trap? The trap is where we are only willing to serve by doing what we like what we're good at, which by the way sometimes means what we think we're good at. And what we think is not too inconvenient. Do you know what, when we're only willing to do things that we like, what we're good at, or what doesn't inconvenience too much, I want to tell you this, that's not serving the Lord. Do you understand? That is not serving the Lord, that's serving yourself. Serving the Lord means laying to one side what you like doing, or what you want to do, in favour of what God wants and what is best for the kingdom. It's really important to get that, and I, I notice you've all gone very, very quiet. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I know this next part, it won't apply to anybody here, but you know what? There are some Christians who will only do whatever they think their gifting is. Now, that's really limiting, and it's also complete nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> 
I got one amen. <laughs> amen. Let me give you an extreme example. Can you imagine God the Father asking God the Son, Jesus, to be brutally beaten and crucified so that all of our sins could be forgiven? Son, there's no other way. I need you to go and be brutally flogged by the Romans and crucified. Will you do it? And he turns around and he says, you know what? That's not really my gifting. <laughs> Can you ask John instead? He's a nice guy. He's always going on about loving people. I think it's more his gifting. Can you ask John instead? And of course, he didn't do that. Jesus did not want to go to the cross. He didn't want to be brutally flogged. He asked the Father to take that cup away from him, if it was possible. But nevertheless, and we know this so well, he said, not my will, but yours be done. Yeah. And we need to embrace that same attitude. Yeah. That's what a servant of the Lord does. Not my will, yours be done. And this morning I'm asking, am I serving God's will or my own will? This morning, are you serving God's will or your own will? <clears throat> Let's expand that a little bit more by looking at a scripture that is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. And this verse says that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us so think about what it means to be an ambassador do you know an ambassador is given a great deal of trust because they have been given authority to accurately represent whoever has sent them they've been given authority to accurately represent whoever has sent them an ambassador is basically a servant <clears throat> an ambassador does not represent himself but acts on behalf of whoever sent him he dare not misrepresent whoever sent him, or else the authority that's been given to him can be just as easily removed as it was given. <clears throat> we are ambassadors for Christ in this world, and therefore he's given us the great privilege of representing him in the world. He's given us the authority to represent him, and that means that we need to act on his behalf and not our own. And do you know what? When the world sees, sees us, they need to see Jesus and not our old selves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They need to see what Jesus looks like in us. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 12 expresses this really, really well. Peter says, dear friends, I urge you. Do you know the, the number of times you see that phrase in the New Testament, there's an urgency about it. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. When we do this, we are acting as ambassadors for Christ and we carry the authority that has been given to us. <clears throat> right, so one last point about... Um, some of the conditions that we need to beat in order to exercise our authority. And then I'll talk briefly about the scope of our authority. So I said we're just gonna scratch the surface. So please don't come at the end, come to me at the end with but this and but that, because I understand there's, there's all sorts of things I've missed out. You know the thing about buts, goats, but, and things don't end up well for goats in the Bible. <laughs> So one further point about submission, when we truly make Jesus our Lord and we act in submission to him, we will recognise the hierarchy of authority that God has established in the church. All authority is not equal. There is a hierarchy and we need to recognise that. And Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 says this, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Have you got confidence in your leaders today? I have confidence in Peter and Teresa and in the leadership team here. I've got confidence because the Holy Spirit told me to come and join this church. So I have confidence in them. And uh, to do that, it meant that I had to lay down Breakthrough Church and the, the leadership of that and merge into Sawyer's Church and come under the authority that has been given to Peter and Teresa and the leadership team here. Now, how can I have such confidence? Do you know what? The Holy Spirit told me to come and do that, but the first person who ever saw Sawyer's Church and Breakthrough Church merging was this man here. And he came to me many years ago 
when he first put that forward. And God always speaks to the highest authority first. And I need you to know that because that's part of the reason I have great confidence in what God is doing through this couple here. Can we just give them a great clap? That's true, isn't it? So we need to understand God gives different levels of authority in the church. So if someone is in leadership over you in the church, they have a higher level of authority than you do. And here is what we need to understand. When God gives authority, he stands behind it. All right? That's why we need to submit to our leaders, because when we submit to them, we're also submitting to God. When we don't submit to them, we are fighting against God. <clears throat> the trouble is, lots of us are armchair leaders. You see this whenever there's a football match on, don't you? <laughs> Suddenly, everybody's an expert football manager, especially this man here. <laughs> His name's Roy. <laughs> Talk to me if you want to know anything about football. <laughs> do you know what? I don't know if they still do this. Years ago, they used to put poems on the tube. Do, do, do they still do that? Yeah. yeah? So you used to, you know, stand there hanging onto your strap for dear life. Reading the poem. There was one I read many years ago. I really like this. And, and this applies to so many of us. It's by Roger McGough, and it's called The Leader. He says, I want to be the leader. I want to be the leader. Can I be the leader? Can I? Can I? Promise? Promise? Yippee, I'm the leader. I'm the leader. Okay, what should we do? <laughs> do you know, it's not so easy being a leader. It's tough. But the burden of responsibility sits on the leadership. God directs them through the Holy Spirit. We need to have confidence that the direction they are telling us God is moving in, if we have confidence in our leader, we need to flow with that. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't make suggestions, as long as they're helpful, but you know what, having confidence in our leaders means we accept what they ultimately decide. We flow with it, even if it's not what we want it, even if it's not what we wanted or originally suggested. Never try to force your way, but submit to them so that their work is a joy, and not a burden. I assure you, if you rebel against them, either passively or actively, you'll find yourself fighting against God, and I could be wrong, but my guess is you will lose that fight. How are we doing for time? Not too bad. <clears throat> Trying to go fast. Um, in the last couple of weeks, there's been an interesting report that's come out by a Christian mathematician called John Hayward, and it's about church growth and decline in the UK. It's um, slightly concerning. But I just want to show you a few charts from that report just to focus on the importance or give you some figures on why it's important that we as a church do not neglect exercising our authority. It's so important. So if I can have the first chart up, um, Sarinda. So do you remember the R number for, for COVID? <laughs> do you remember that? If you're above one, it's highly contagious and it's growing. If you're below one, it's not very contagious and it's going down. Well, this guy has applied the R number <coughs> to how contagious the different denominations are in the UK. Now, they're not all in there. AOG is, is not in there. But um, of, of these um, denominations that he looked at, only three are above one. All of the others are in decline and have been for decades. Those three, Elim, New Frontiers, and the Fellowship of Evangelical Churches, their R number is just above one, and they are growing. They're heading in the right direction. The others are all in decline. Next chart, please, Sarinda. Now, this should really focus. This is just on one of them. This is United Reformed Church membership, and it goes from just 1996 up to, well, what is it, 2017. Uh, those are real numbers. Um, now, that scale on the side should alarm you. In 2017, look at the numbers. It's about 50,000. What's the population of Brentwood? 60, 70,000, something like that. In other words, the entire population of the United Reformed Church is less than the population of Brentwood. It's in decline. So next one. So from this model, these are estimated extinction dates for all of those. Um... <laughs> now, now, now look. Okay, I know that's 
it's funny, but it's not. This could happen. We laugh because we think it can't happen. It can. All right? Uh, a few years ago, I co compared the annual report for the Assemblies of God with the annual report for another de denomination. I won't tell you which one it was, but it, it was not any of these. Uh, that, the other de denomination was all about how many churches were closing in a year. The AOG was all about how many churches we're planting in a year. Amen. And that's the difference between a church which is growing and one which is declining. Yeah. Now let's have a look at one more chart. This is really, really interesting because this shows um, the type of theology, if you like, that's in the church. Red or orange, whatever that color is. Um, that's Bible-based, traditional, word of God. That's the authority we stand on. That's what we preach. No compromise. Um, so all of those orange ones, they're pretty much all seeing growth, except for one. <clears throat> As it gets more and more yellow, they're more and more liberal. So they embrace some of the teaching of the world today. They're all in decline, all of them. The moment you compromise the word of God, you will enter into decline because you lose the authority that God's given us. So we need to understand that. So let me just, uh, having shown you that de depressing set of slides, <laughs> But um, the good thing is that uh, the moment we stick with the Word of God yeah. and the Holy Spirit, yes. we're going to see growth. Yeah. And do you know what the reason for the lack of growth is? It's lack of conversions and an unwillingness to adapt. So sticking with old religion and traditions and unwilling to adapt to fit the culture. All right? So that's something for you to think about. So let's briefly um, look at the scope of our authority then. So I want you to consider what the Bible says about the scope of the authority that Jesus has given us. So let's jump to Matthew chapter 28 and verses 18 to 20. Jesus says this, we will all know this, this is the core and the heart of the church. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. There's the submission part. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So notice that before Jesus commissioned his disciples, he first declared the scope of his authority. There is no limit to it. It extends to all of heaven and all of yeah. earth. That is the authority that he has. Nobody has any higher authority than that. Jesus is the highest authority. Yeah. And we come under that. Yeah. <laughs> and then he commissions his disciples to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom and to make disciples out of those who would believe the message and we are operating under that authority yeah now you can ask the question why do we need authority to preach the gospel and it's very simple we need authority to preach the gospel because no one can forgive sins but god yeah. and yet when we lead someone in a prayer of repentance we can declare with the authority he's given us that their sins are Forgiven. <laughs> well, I'm just going to look for Tyrone there, but I can't see. Where is he? Tyrone, just stand up, will you? This is Tyrone, everybody. Hi, Tyrone. Tyrone and Lorna recently gave their hearts to Jesus. Amen. <laughs> With the authority that we have in this room, Tyrone, right, we want to cement in your mind your sins are forgiven. Amen. You are saved. Yeah. You don't need to do anything else. Yeah. All right? Everything else you do from here on in will be out of love for Jesus. Yeah. All right? Yes? Yes. 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 You take that. <clears throat> also in the Gospels, we see Jesus gives us power and authority. So uh, I'm not going to jump to these scriptures, but in Luke chapter 9 and verse 1 when Jesus sent out the 12 and in Mark chapter 16 verses 17 to 18 he clearly gave them power and authority which included um, the authority to heal all the all diseases to drive out demons and in Mark 16 verse 20 it says that these signs remember at the beginning of the year we talked about this being signs these signs confirmed the word so the preaching of the gospel should be accompanied by signs which include healing the sick driving out demons, raising the dead, and all those things. Now, sometimes we struggle with those issues, don't we? Because sometimes we pray and nothing happens. And so we give up. Or we're worried because we pray 
nothing happens, but we worry how that, people's, that person's gonna feel disappointed or whatever. And we're not to worry about any of those things. We are simply to obey the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. All right? I wonder if you know about um, CFAN, the organization that Reinhard Bonnke established, now being run by um, his protege, Daniel Kalender. And I rem remember hearing him say how he prayed for 90 blind people and none of them got healed. And he was talking to Reinhard Bonnke, he said, how many people have got to pray for? How many blind people um, before I give up? He said, he said, you never give up. He said, forget the, the previous 90, you just keep praying. Amen. And God will open the eyes he wants to open. We don't have to worry about the work that God has to do. We only have to do what he's commanded us to do. We need to pray for the sick. Yes. If we don't pray for the sick, we can't expect anybody to be healed, can we? That's the authority that we have. <clears throat> so again, if you come across people today who are living in unbelief and they tell you, but, but, remember what happens to buts? <laughs> We walk, we walk in faith, not unbelief. We walk with boldness, yeah. not fear. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? One last thing and then I'm gonna wrap up. I hope I haven't gone over time. I might have done. <clears throat> Are you still with me? Yes. <laughs> now, you might not like this. Sorry. I'm still used to you. <laughs> That could be good or bad. <laughs> you might not like this last one, but this is so important. Do you remember that chart about um, uh, the liberal theology declining and those sticking to the word of God growing? You know that, right? Jesus has given us authority to confront sin in the church, and we must do that. Nobody likes doing that, but Jesus told us to do it. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, guess what? You've won them over. You have won them over. If they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And I want you to see the objective here is not to condemn but to win over yeah. those who are sinning. Probably, <clears throat> as I said, none of us like to do this. Nobody likes confrontation, but it is an act of love to rescue someone from sin. There is no love in leaving a person captive to sin. Do you know God disciplines those he loves? He's given us authority to discipline on his behalf, and the aim is always restoration and not condemnation. If we don't keep the house pure, we won't have the authority that Jesus has given to us. We will not grow. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> I know it's tough. I uh, know it's hard. But we have to do it. Lastly, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus said to the 72 that he sent out, I have given you, now I, I love this verse, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions yeah. and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Wow. I have given you authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. <clears throat> now, we sometimes give the enemy too much credit. But I want to give you an example. This is a police story. <laughs> it's the only one I've got. <laughs> it's almost identical to the one Peter gave two weeks ago. I don't care. It's the only one I've got. <laughs> I once saw a single policeman stop all of the traffic on the M25 because there'd been an accident. That Joy and I, we were right at the front of the, of the queue where he stopped, and there he was, just like Peter said, hand up, all of these cars stopped. Now, can you imagine the build-up of traffic on the M25, how quickly there was, the number of vehicles there were there, and there's this one guy standing with his hands up. Now, the power in those vehicles exceeded the power in that one guy many, many times over, and yet his authority was able to stop all of that power until he said, now you can go. Yeah. Yeah. Authority trumps yeah. power. Yes. The enemy might have power, but we have been given authority yes. to yes. overcome yes. all the power yes. of the enemy. Yes. Now, 
here's the condition in James 4, 7. I'm going to finish with this. Submit yourselves. So we come full circle. Yeah. Submit yourselves then to God. Yeah. Resist the devil yeah. and he will flee from you. You know, it, it won't be a tough fight. It, it won't be a tough battle. When we submit to God, the moment we resist him, he flees. Yeah. A couple of weeks, uh, a few weeks back, Eric preached. And in it, he mentioned a guy called Smith Wigglesworth. Mm. He was one of the Pentecostal pioneers from the last century. Very powerful man of God. And there's a story goes how he woke up one night and he literally had a vision. He saw the devil sitting on the end of his bed. And um, he said, oh, it's you. And turned over and went back to sleep. Again. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we need to be, folks. Do you know what? We serve a God who can move the immovable. Yes. We serve a God who can break the unbreakable. Amen. We serve a God when he says something, I believe it. When he does something, I also believe it. And this morning, if you come to that place where perhaps you feel like you've settled a bit on just the justification, it's wonderful having Jesus as Saviour, but serve him? No, that's far too inconvenient. God wants you to commit yourself afresh this morning to rise up and serve him. And if some of the things that Peter's challenged you to get involved with today, you think, oh, that's going to be too hard. I could never do that. I want to tell you God's speaking to you this morning. Yeah. With me, you can. And he wants you involved. And I wonder if you stand with me this morning that we might commit ourselves afresh to be a church where it's not just a subset that serves, but every single one of us, we say Jesus is Lord and we're going to serve him. Time. Is that better? No. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you going to stand with me? Yes. Come on, let's all stand. Let's just reach out our hands to heaven. Let's recommit ourselves to the Lord. And let's not just leave it in this place. Let's then act on it. You know, exercising authority means acting on it. So together, let's just lift our voices. Lord Jesus, we commit ourselves afresh to you this morning. Just use your own words. Use your own words just to speak to him now. Father, we commit ourselves to you. Lord Jesus, we thank you because you served us in such a powerful way by dying on that cross. Lord, in such a painful manner. Lord, you did it all because you loved us. And we want to commit ourselves afresh this morning that we will be a people who serve you. We pray, Father, where there is fear, Lord, you would give us boldness. We pray, Heavenly Father, where there's un unbelief and doubt, Lord, we pray that you would cause faith to rise in our hearts today. Lord, that when we see the sick, you would give us the boldness to, to pray for them, that we might see healings in our day. As we do the on the move, we pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit, that we might see miracles on the town, in the town of Britain. We pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, for a move of your spirit in this place this morning. Lord, cause us to rise up as servants of the living God for the glory of your name. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.